Welcome to Praxis, I'm Olivia Rousset. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Sydney, as well as those joining us by video link in Dili, and those watching on APAC online or listening on radio. Today we're discussing gender equality and development. On our panel we have Gillian Brown, the Principal Advisor for Gender Equity at AusAid, Lulu Mitshabu, the Africa Program Coordinator at Caritas, and Julie McKay, the Executive Director for the National Committee of UN Women. At the end of the panellist discussion, I'll invite questions from the audience. While gender is not synonymous with women, when it comes to gender inequality, it's women who are the losers. And not just in the developing world. While many advances have been made in the past few decades, there's no country in the world that has been able to eliminate the gender gap. The World Bank's World Development Report tells us that gender is smart economics. When women are disadvantaged, the whole family and community also suffer, and the disadvantage is passed on from generation to generation. But this is not the only reason to fight for the global empowerment of women. It's also a basic human right. According to the World Development Report, nearly four million women are missing each year in the developing world. Of these, two-fifths are aborted due to a preference for male children, a sixth die in early childhood, and over a third die in their reproductive years. Women are also the hardest hit by the HIV AIDS epidemic. According to the UN, in the Pacific, two out of every three women have reported being physically or sexually abused by their partner or spouse. A recent US study found that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 48 women are raped every hour, and these are just the abuses that are reported. Stopping violence against women and striving for gender equality in all areas will require challenging how gender roles and power relations are versed in society and may even take generations. Julie, I'd like to just start with a question um, to you, but a bit of a broad one, but why has it been so difficult to achieve gender equality? Or what are some of the reasons? I think it's a good question to open on. I think in many ways that's the million dollar question, that the complexity behind gender equality is just huge. I think power and self-interest plays into it. I think a history of inequality continues to perpetuate people's inability to see a world that looks different from the present. And I think also that our response to gender equality hasn't been consistent enough over time. So there's some of the reasons. Okay. And Lulu, what, when it comes to gender equality, what do you think should be the first thing that we focus on? I think uh, coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo myself and uh, working for an agency such as Caritas Australia, I would say that uh, we should look at violence against women. It's an area where it needs attention and uh, is an area where it's lacking a lot of uh, funding and the resourcing. So I would say violence against women would mm. be one of the issues, specifically targeting men, women and children to address this issue. And Gillian, it's an incredibly diverse issue. Is it reasonable to expect that we can achieve gender equality in all areas? I think um, one of the things that was interesting to me coming out of the World Development Report was looking at, at how a lot of the dimensions of gender uh, inequality had, had really, the gaps had closed so much over the last couple of decades. So gaps in health and education, for example. And what it showed was the areas where gaps are not closing. That, you know, there are some areas and, um, the, for example, the gap in wages in Australia is, is the same as the gaps in some other developing countries like Cambodia. So it, that's not economic growth that has, uh, that has changed those dimensions. Uh, this helps us focus on areas where, as in, in the economist terms, uh, there are market failures. And when there's a market va failure, it needs an intervention to overcome that failure. And, and it also puts the emphasis on having state interventions uh, in, those, uh, in those aspects to really overcome it. And I think um, violence against women is one of the most, the, the serious manifestations of gender inequalities and gender mm -hmm. gaps that we have to um, in the in the Pacific, there's it's gender violence against women is is a major issue. Mm. Why is it so yes. prevalent in the Pacific? I, social norms play into a lot, but um, I think uh, as I said, it's a it's a manifestation of gender inequalities, and uh, and what you see in the Pacific. I mean, only only two percent of the parliamentarians in the Pacific are women, mm. um, and because of that 
well, I think because of that, uh, um, less, uh, I think 60% of the countries than Pacific don't yet have laws in place to criminalize uh, violence against women. So you have this kind of cycle of, um, of inequality where all the dimensions, the uh, agency, which means the ability to make effective decisions and to participate in policy and decision making, um, when women are not participating in decision making, when they're not empowered economically so that they have their ability to, um, their bargaining power within a family or within their community is low, then these manifest themselves into um, a, into an environment in which violence against women becomes acceptable and and it compounds itself from generation to generation. The World Development Report talked a lot about agency for victims of domestic violence. Can you mm. talk about you know the manifestations of agency, like how that might? Yeah, I think. It, very often when we're talking about, I mean, agency is a difficult term to really uh, get a grip yeah. on, I think. It, it really means the ability to make an effective uh, choice and to take part in decision making, to, to influence decisions. Um, and it, it, it really, I mean, I think for a long time we've talked about women's leadership and things like that. And, but that could be a little bit misleading because it tends to leave people thinking about parliamentarians, you know, numbers of women in parliament, numbers of women in the formal leadership. Well, actually what agency talks about is different levels of um, the ability to participate in decision making from, from um, within the household, within the family to make decisions on the number of children uh, you have, who you, um, uh, access to resources, ability to take um, family planning for example. Uh, but it, it also is your, the women's um, ability to make decisions about her own family, about her children, the amount she invests, and that's where you get the intergenerational benefits of it. And then at another level, agency is about collective agency, where women act together to make changes, either changes that bring about uh, improvements for women or changes that bring about improvements for their whole communities. Um, I, I think one, one of the m most interesting uh, quotes that I saw coming out of the uh, WDR was that when women got the vote the when when women got the vote in the US it resulted in saving the lives of 20,000 children a year because politicians made different decisions because they were speaking to their female uh, constituents the, the, the figures like that are very powerful to show you know it really does make a difference mm -hmm. And how, how is that approach different to, to what's been done or recommended in the past? Uh, well, I think what, um, what we look at, there is that formal aspect of uh, agency and decision making, you know, the electoral systems, and which um, UN women I know have been involved in. Maybe Julie will come back to that uh, later. But I think that we also are tending to look more at those informal mechanisms. What does it mean um, f to how, how, what's the role that we can play to support women to form coalitions and networks and be more effective in uh, influencing decisions, not necessarily from within the formal systems, but from without. I did some analysis in 2005 looking at the, um, all the domestic violence laws that have been passed in the East Asia and Pacific region, and there wasn't one that hadn't come into being because of a huge um, movement of women in civil society that had lobbied really hard over many years to bring that change about. And that's the kind of um, movement, I think, that we need to look at. How can we support that more to bring about more changes to improve the lives of women? And are there, in the Pacific, are there many women in, in formal leadership roles? Two percent of women in Parliament over the whole Pacific. There are hardly any. I think there's only um, one um, the one minister in Papua New Guinea is now a former minister, so, um, it, you know, this is, but the challenge for women who get into formal decision making is very often that 
that they are bound by party lines and things like this. So it's, it's actually quite difficult when women are in such a minority within those uh, formal decision-making bodies. It's, quite, it's very difficult to expect them to be the lobby and the advocates for women, although you know, many of them do. But th that's a tough ask for them, and they need that support from outside as well. There are a lot more women in, in Africa, for instance, in, in leadership roles, though, are there? Or That's right, and this is one of the big changes I think we've seen in the last, um, certainly the last five to ten years, is there's uh, the new presidents uh, of African countries that mm -hmm. uh, have uh, been elected over that time, and ministers of finance, too, which is quite... Um, incredible to see the number of women being uh, appointed as ministers of finance planning and other positions in Africa. So. Mm. Now Lulu do you think that is having or will have a trickle down effect towards improving the... I think it will mm. in the future but we also need to consider how much influence these women have and uh, Africa, we're talking 53 countries, but uh, when you look at the progress, it's been maybe in few countries in Africa, but there is those countries still lacking, and those countries where women still um, are just object, and the voice has not been heard. So I think we have, is, uh, I have hope that this will lead us to something, but also I think there is a lot of work that is needed. Mm -hmm. And for going to Democratic Republic of Congo, it's been said that it's the worst place to be a woman in the world. Can you outline that a bit for yeah, us? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo and I'm here saying it's the worst place to be a woman mm. today in um, modern history where uh, I'll just give you, um, maybe I'd like to give you an example so that you understand when they say about a uh, worst place in the world. What does these women go through? Last time I, t I went to DRC for my visit to one of our program, I met this woman called Fura. And uh, this lady was, uh, she's a victim of uh, violence and uh, if for those of you who don't know anything about the DRC, the DRC been in a conflict for more than uh, 20 years. But uh, uh, going back to my story, I met Fura, and Fura was a victim of rape, sexual terror. She was raped by five combatants. They come to a house, they tied the husband, they took, her, they took the husband away, before taking the husband away, they rape uh, the daughters in front of him. They rape the woman in front of him and they force his son, his first son, to rape one of the daughters. So because of that, rape is a taboo in the DRC. First of all, after they release the husband, the husband was traumatized. And because rape is, is a taboo, and uh, he can't go back to his family, he has to separate with the wife. And the wife don't have the right to land or to anything. So they remain with, ch she was Basia Ofura, with four children, no properties, no money, and she has to leave because she can't go back to her own family. There is stigma attached to that. So this poor woman, Fura, was left alone in the world. The shame of being a woman, she told me. She told me one of the things that still stay in my mind and really I want to say to all of you, she said to me that her grandmother before she died, she said to her, if you have any girls, don't name them after me. Unless you have a, a boy, then you can name that boy after me because it's customary law to name your children after your grandmother and stuff. That shame of being that is phenomenal. So that's why my focus is saying, yes, we have to address this violence against our women. 
is affect the whole community, is going to affect this woman. She will be traumatized for all her life, but she has to look after these children. And she has girls. What this poor woman going to pass on to this future generation? So that's very important. That's the gap. When we're making these policies and when we're trying to address this, let's take into consideration. Let's go back to reality and see why this we didn't have much progress in a country like the DRC. So probably... So rape was used as a tool of war. Exactly. The war finished officially years ago. Yep. This is recently you went... Exactly. It, because it's, it's just not... Uh, a side effect of war, rape. It become now a way of controlling and uh, over resources, over land, people come to you and destabilize your family so they have power. Because they know they can get, the men have to exactly. leave. Exactly. The men have to leave and uh, they have control over land and they have control over resources. So it's also about, it's also linked to the mineral resources because people want to exploit that. And uh, for them to do that, they have to own the land, they have to control. It's all about power, resources. Mm. It's a curse for the DRC, the resources we have. And uh, we're wrapping the most resource in our country, which is women and girls. Mm. And the whole future is for leaders is jeopardized. So we need to do a little bit more. We need to do education, we need to empower. So an holistic approach to this could be one of the things we should be looking at when we're making uh, this uh, policy and decision. It's not just a black and white. But that's the, that's the, it's a huge question. Exactly. But what, what needs to be done? To st to, to, like it's become normalized, it's become a, a tool yep. for gaining wealth for whatever land. But a lot of education needs to go around. Mm -hmm. We need to get men involved in all our programs. It's not just a woman issue. I heard, I go back to Congo and I, we had this meeting and there was only women. And people say, oh, my husband says it's a woman issue. We cannot discuss that. No, men should be part of that because they're also going through a lot of trauma, shame and stuff. They cannot just say that. And to have the good response to this, we have to involve men and women, and they have to work together to address this problem. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, so we, as we were discussing earlier as well, a lot of the generation of men coming up also uh, yeah. were born from rape yeah. encounters. So to them, it's a normal part of who exactly. they are as well. But rape, children born of rape, you know, they're not accepted. Mm. Uh, culturally and in society, they're different, they're outcasts. And these kids, they're growing up with anger in them and uh, a sense of revenge. When I grow up, I have to do this. No respect for women because they, nobody told them how to love. They don't love really. So if you empower a woman, and if they're able to take care of the family, they're able to love this kid and provide. But because if, this, if there is reconciliation or she wants to be part of the society, she can't bring that child with her because that child represents shame. So we need to work with these women. We need to work with men to accept this and uh, to do know that these people are human beings. They didn't ask to be born. But let's tackle this issue so that we stop this massive terror that is happening in many countries in Africa, not just in DRC. There is a lot of country in Africa, uh, I'm sure also in Asia, mm. where rape has been used as tactic of war. What do you think the international community, because you know, obviously it's a mineral rich country yep. and there's a lot of foreign investment, what further things do you think can be done by the international community? I think there is a lot can be done. I can keep starting by saying, first of all, let's ask where you're getting your mineral from. Like in case of the DRC, cotton is a problem. Well, I, I don't know if you remember in 2000, there was a rush for cotton. Everybody was rushing. People wanted cotton. And 
a lot of, um, uh, there is a good reserve of cotton in DRC and is exploited illegally every day from the DRC. And this at what cost? At what cost? We all have some kind of blood in our hands. We're using this laptop and telephone, mobile phone, and we're not asking questions about where these people are getting this cotton from. Is it from the blood, you know, the RC country, or is it from a legal way of doing this? So that's one of the things we should ask ourselves. Policy that addressing gender-based uh, 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 violence against women, we should invest more in countries like the DRC. Because um, without education, without health, without trauma counseling, we're not going to advance. And we're lacking already in that aspect. So we need to address that. So there is a lot of ask to do and get informed, get involved. It's not a woman issue, it's everyone issue. It's not a side effect of war, it's uh, is a criminal kind of things, is a human right abuse, is also, um, also condemned by the society. So we have to get involved. Mm, thank you. Um, Julie, talking about looking at programs that try and uh, approach things on all levels, the so UN Women's been working on a pilot project called Safe Cities. Mm. Can you give an example of what that, say, taking Port Moresby as an example, what that involves? Yeah, sure, Olivia. I think one of the challenges with how we address issues like violence against women is working out where exactly violence is occurring at all levels. And so UN Women started a pilot program initially in South America um, to try to assess in, in a city context what actually happens for women, what is their experience. And what they found in the initial baseline studies was that women experienced violence but also fear of violence that uh, meant that they couldn't participate in the formal economy, it meant that they weren't able to participate in the lives of their families and communities in the way that they wanted to. So they started to look at things like the physical concept of the construct of a city and how things like lighting affected women's ability to move around freely. They then looked at things like the marketplace where women were trying to sell their goods and, and earn money and a source of income for their families and started to realise that in those marketplaces there was a whole range of ways that women were being taken advantage of. So starting to work at that really grassroots level to look at a marketplace and say, well, how do we get women involved in the council that runs that marketplace? How do we get women involved in setting the fees for that marketplace so that the fees are you know, commensurate with the amount of money that they're actually earning? And so out of that initial pilot program launched a global program that's now being replicated in six sites across the world, one of which is Port Moresby. And so now the initial investigation is, is happening into what exactly is the situation of, of Port Moresby and how can, at a sort of structural level, as well as at a policy level, as well as at a really grassroots level, can we actually shift the, the way the city works to better support women? Mm. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the impact of financial security, financial empowerment, how that sort of flows on to improving the situation for women? Yeah. I think economic security is, is one of the things that we do now have a lot of information about that demonstrates when women are empowered economically, that there's the impact on their children and on their own lives, but also on the, on the community is, is really significant. And that's things like um, when women have economic empowerment and control of their own economic resources. Um, they're able to make better health and education decisions for their children. They're more likely to um, make decisions about when to invest and, and sell assets in a way that assists them make decisions for their family. And there's some really interesting research that you and women's doing at the moment about land use and how when women are empowered economically, they actually make different decisions about land use, which has a really positive in, in, impact on the overall environment. So there's some sort of very high level examples, but I think show that when women start to be empowered economically, the community benefits in a whole range of ways. What about no, the women may go to the market, they may make the money, they take it home. How do they stop, say, their husband or their fam extended families or community saying that some of that's mine? How do they maintain control of, of their money, of their earnings? I, I think, and I'd be interested to hear both our other speakers' um, thoughts on this, I think it's a really, it's a, it's a tough one. It's actually about challenging the way families 
you know, traditionally operate and trying to demonstrate that when women have control over their own resources, they actually are able to better impact the lives of their children in the longer term. So starting to actually talk to people about examples and talk to people about the importance of investing in education, but also giving women innovative ways to make those choices in advance of taking the money home. So there's programs where women can pay their school fees, pay the market costs, pay other healthcare associated fees before their money comes into the home environment. So they've actually made a whole lot of those decisions ahead of coming back with the, the, the sort of money that can then be questioned. So, uh, but I think it's cultural change um, in a whole range of ways. Mm -hmm. the, maybe just I can add that it's not a easy thing. No. Just uh, in case of uh, people that I work with and I'll keep referring to Africa, that caused a lot of problem where culturally men make all the decision and now a woman have this money and they're able to decide, yeah, I can send my girl to school instead of investing in boys or keeping for boys to go back to university and sending the girls. That's caused a lot of problem. Mm -hmm. So empowering women is one step, but it's not just, yes, let's give them the money and they go up there, they have a voice. No, let's look at a way that we could respond and um, break those culture affairs, work with the whole family, not just a woman. Yeah. So that's why I keep bringing men into this. It's mm -hmm. not just a black and white mm -hmm. question, let's empower the women and that's it. That also sort of plays into the thing that women, it's terrific for women to find that economic um, access to, to, to money and be able to earn money, but they're also looking after the house, probably the sick exactly. members of the family, the children, yep. their workload is, yeah. is massive and often double of that. Yep. Of how, how, what are some of the things that can be done to try and balance that stuff mm -hmm. or value that stuff? Or it happens in all, all societies yeah, around the world. I think that's the, the key thing is that the sh sort of shared responsibility for caregiving is an issue that, that transcends any mm. you know, national boundary. And I think we know here in Australia we have massive challenges facing women in terms of being able to access equal opportunities to employment because of an inability to access affordable childcare, because of an inability for us to re rebalance um, the, the burden of unpaid work in the home. And that, that is, is, you know, the same experience of women across the world. And I think, you know, how you actually start to look at the total productivity of, of a community mm -hmm. and actually put a value on unpaid work and start to actually say it has to be valued as part of mm -hmm. how we make decisions and, and in doing that, starting to make sure that that work is actually spread across all members of the community. But also I think that leads forward into an area that we, we're going to need to be looking at in the future much more, um, is that this is an economy in and of itself, the care economy. And I first heard the care economy talked about in Vietnam a few years ago where um, it was an interesting situation because under the um, you know, previous uh, regimes and everything, uh, care provision had been provided by the state mm -hmm. and the women had lost it and the same in Mongolia and uh, many of those countries. So they actually had less services and help from the state to look after sick, disabled children than they used to have. Um, and they bemoan this fact in their loss of services. But I think as, you know, moving forward, this burden is going to increase. The number of elderly people are going to increase in the world. Um, and a lot of that service provision, if you look in Asia, is actually being provided by poor rural women coming into the town. So rather than saying, well, you know, perhaps they shouldn't do it or something like that, you know, actually making that a professional, um, uh, you know, a prof profession in and of, it, of itself and providing the resources and the funding, the accreditation, the training and everything else like that to recognize it could have a benefit for, you know, for, for everybody. So. Um, I, I, I think a lot more work that needs to be done absolutely. on that. But it, and addressing yeah. some of the flow on issues mm. where you see um, in some of the developed countries or the more developed countries actually attracting a whole lot of migrant workers to come and look after right, children yeah. and be part of that care economy, then setting up a whole generation of children in the home country mm. that actually don't have their mothers around supporting them. Mm. And so the issues that it then creates at that yeah. level as well, I think, are incredibly um, complex and, and need to be um, need to be addressed. Mm. It's a huge topic. Yeah. I might at this point make it bigger and open it up to you guys. Um, any questions? I have one from Dilly, which I might start with. In 2012, 
we have two major elections which will be a great opportunity for women's participation as voters and as candidates. What is Australia's plan and priority on gender issue in Timor-Leste? And this is from Annie Serrano, the senior gender advisor for the UNDP in Timor-Leste. Well, well, I think, you know, Timor-Leste is, is, is a very interesting case when, if you go back to some of the first elections that they held, it was, um, it, it was incredible to see how a country in that just one election could elect so many women. I forget how many it was now. I think it was over 20 uh, 20% 20 in 2002, whatever it was. Um, so, and that did come because of a lot of effort by a lot of people, including uh, and especially the Timorese women who were driving uh, this through the importance of getting women elected in their communities. But then with support from UN women, the other donors and things coming in uh, to train voters, to train the uh, candidates and things. So I, I think there's, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But just, just on that one interesting thing that I thought was that um, what we do know now is that when women have been leaders in their community, it changes the perceptions of communities about how uh, the perceptions of both men and women in their community about how they perceive women leaders. And they're more likely to vote for women in an election. And that can be, for example, women as lead, um, in water management committees or on uh, school education committees or any kind of committees like that. If we can get women, you know, starting at the bottom, getting women into those roles so that their communities can see what they're capable of and see what women are capable of, it has a knock on us. So I think we have to approach it on a number of angles. I do have another one from Dilly, um, from Annie again to Lulu. What do you think the international community can do to help victims like those in Congo DRC to gain justice? In Timor-Leste, the Commission on Reconciliation and Truth concluded that there are thousands of women and children victims of human rights and gender-based violence from 1947 to 1999. What I can say about addressing uh, the international community should strengthen the law to have a way of monitoring this uh, law that uh, pro supposed to protect women, because there is no way you can monitor these laws. In DRC, when you go up there, they will say to you, yes, we have law in place to protect women, and especially uh, implementing the UN resolution uh, 1825. You have all the literature there, but you don't have a way of monitoring this. So I think they should also invest in that, and that could be another way of helping uh, to see if there is any progress to strengthen a justice system which is in exist, uh, doesn't exist in uh, DRC at the moment. And uh, as also in DRC, there will be an election in November, and uh, there have been a lot of uh, people investing in civic uh, education like a uh, women role, like uh, to basic rights, to know their own basic rights, so they can really advocate a law that protect them. And they can hold these people accountable. So there will be another way of empowering these women actually to monitor if the government is doing what they say they're doing to protect the women and also invest in those international organizations that are working in, uh, to protect women, uh, the, uh, such as ourselves, and uh, to educate uh, girls and women. I think that would be another way of addressing. Mm -hmm. Also, I talk about the, uh, the mineral. is one, the resources that the DRC have, we need to have control. We have to have a way of regulate that so that it benefits the people, especially the women and children of the country, not outside. I can't, it's a bad thing to bring up something without knowing the statistic, but on exactly. a, a previous praxis, there, someone brought up a statistic about the amount that goes f from the mining royalties to the government, and it was a pittance yes. as well. So let alone filtering down to the people, people. what's going officially to the government was, yeah. was very, very little. Very little. Julie, would you like to talk, can you talk a little bit about getting international 
donors interested on issues like this? Mm. What, what, what the focus is? I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. Gender equality has typically been very underfunded across just about every country in the world and across a range of programs. And we have seen a huge acceleration in the investment, and maybe, Julian, if you want to talk a bit more about that, in terms of from donor countries. But I think it's a, it's a difficult one because it doesn't demonstrate short-term quick wins, quick outcomes. So you can't run a program for 12 months and demonstrate that societal attitudes towards women have changed. And so what you see start to happen is programs that are really trying to shift attitudes and, and trying to really challenge the traditional ways that things have been done in communities, losing funding after two or three years because they're not able to demonstrate to donors that they're actually um, you know, building uh, fast enough in terms of outcomes. So I think you know, from our perspective, being um, partly a donor NGO to UN Women, but also uh, trying to build donor support here in Australia, it's been a really interesting experience. How do you get the corporate sector to take responsibility for gender and development? globally and starting to have that conversation with the corporate sector about you know in an increasingly globalized world what happens through their supply chain if women continue to be disempowered across the world and starting to actually try and build out the economic impact of that so that you know if you work for a, a global company here in Australia you start to think oh actually I should be funding you know, grassroots organisations. And I think the mining industry is definitely investing a huge amount in this space about how do we actually get the best outcomes for our community development. And I know, and I might hand to you, but, but AusAid and, and the Minerals Council of Australia are currently working on a project to, to work out exactly how can they best invest in um, social responsibility that has long-term impacts for women, but also for communities. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a good, and actually, you know, although there are the negative aspects of it, and, and if you take mining in particular, there's well documented the, the negative impacts of uh, mining programs on women, but it can also be turned into, into a real positive. It also provides a real opportunity. And I was up in the uh, a mine site in uh, Papua New Guinea a few years ago, and I was meeting with women in the community and asking them, you know, when did you first get engaged in decision making and this kind of thing? And um, it was because of the mine. So, you know, it, it can actually trigger a kind of societal change if if that opportunity can be exploited when it comes up. You know. The investment they're making is huge. I yeah. remember having a meeting where I discovered that one of the Australian mining companies was spending more on their corporate social responsibility programs than we were spending in the region on all of our programs and thinking, wow, if we can actually work with them to, to make their programs gender sensitive and to engage women in all of the programs they're running, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, and, and there's, I mean, you know, even just uh, turning uh, around and showing uh, the positive impacts of these, are the, another of the findings of the um, WDR was that, of the World Development Report, was that um, countries that don't get their women into the workforce and things are less able to compete in the modern sort of the globalized world and market economy and the cost is rising to the, of the cost of inequalities is rising so uh, this is quite a powerful argument i think to uh, to young and what that's one of the area i think australia could contribute in a country like drc with mm -hmm. the expertise in mining and they can actually bring that to uh, a country like DRC where corruption is uh, one of the major issues there. Mm -hmm. People are doing contract with uh, individual, you know, like to benefit themselves and stuff like that. So this could be one of the area where Australia could actually offer you know, some expertise and to it, country yeah. like And it's surprising how when economic opportunities have come up that can make societal changes, how quickly exactly. so the so-called norms do change. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think in Bangladesh when, you know, there was um, a lot of restrictions on girls and women's mobility for, you know, centuries and this was a social norm and everything like that. But as soon as the garment factories opened and there were actually jobs created, oh, suddenly there was no more restrictions on the on girls um, ability to travel to the factories and the same in uh, in Cambodia so when the factories opened it actually within a couple of years it went from you know girls not being able to access into secondary schools then suddenly the factories were looking for girls with secondary school education 
and the figures for girls in secondary school sort of overtook those of boys. So, you know, it can be very powerful um, for just removing these so, sort of so-called social norms that that create barriers in, in so the, it's the economy. The, the economic imperatives sometimes I'm to not push saying, aside you know, there's the, the so-called cultural. There's also the lot yeah. of negative, negative things that do come in yeah, with that as well exactly. as those which have to be monitored. So it, 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 a careful approach is mm -hmm. always a good one. <laughs> mm. Any questions? I just wanted to pick up on your comments on Bangladesh where you know, in a 10 year space of time, you had over 2 million poor girls coming from rural, rural areas mm. to, um, to Dhaka. And as you said, it, it totally transformed the public space and you had lighting, you had transportation, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And you also had international buyers of Bangladeshi garments, you know, creating in incredibly good uh, CSR, social, sorry, corporate social responsibility programs. Um, and, you know, you have healthcare creches, et cetera, in some of these factories that were kind of unimaginable 10 years ago. But I just wanted to ask Jill, because of, you know, in the Pacific, you're dealing with such small countries, you don't have the scale, you don't have, you know, the, uh, the prospect of mm. labour intensive manufacturing, which in particular brings about, you know, has the potential to bring about enormous change. Um, where is the space you see in the Pacific, you know, in terms of continuing the dialogue and whether you could uh, elaborate on your earlier comments about um, civil society um, mm. and fostering civil society in the region? Mm. Yeah, no, I think this, uh, the Pacific is difficult. I mean, one of the things that struck me working in the Pacific is is that you meet these in, fantastic, incredibly sort of powerful women and uh, which and but it's also sort of like these women are there. How, how is it so difficult to, to bring about changes? I think one of the women uh, at a meeting, she was saying, well, you know, it, but it's really difficult to challenge a view and things. If you're, you know, if the person who put that view forward is sitting next to you in the church on Sunday, and, and I think is, you know, those the closed communities, um, or not, just by the nature. If you're on an island, you know, you don't have the huge linkages and things um, outside. I, I think opening up some of those uh, linkages, actually getting more of that regional. Um, integration it doesn't have to be through actually face-to-face -face meetings but some of the things like uh, Femlink uh, in the Pacific now is doing sort of community radio work and um, working with young women in the area um, uh, and I think that's you know is is reaching out and making those uh, broader networks I think it's hugely challenging uh, working in Bougainville with the, with the women there, they were looking and saying, you know, what what would be great would be to have role models from, say, Sol Solomon Islands, who've got small businesses over there, come over and show us how to do it in our context, given the situations and the challenges we're dealing with. I think there's, there's also um, some of the mobility, and if you take a, a PNG, just what Julie was mentioning about the safe cities, I mean, that's Port Moresby. But, you know, the rest of PNG is out there. And, and the, um, the, the dangers and the risks for women in getting around can be huge. And I think, to some extent, even sort of basic infrastructure and things like that can help to open uh, some of those markets up for women. But I think it is, it is true, it is hugely difficult. One of, one of the most worrying things I think I've seen in, um, in recent years was the graphs from, it was actually the World Bank did some qualitative work leading into the World Development Report that um, Australia had funded for them. And the graphs from Papua New Guinea showed, what they showed was they'd done focus groups with old women and young women, older men and younger men and ask them a whole range of different questions about their aspirations and how things had changed and how they saw the world and things. Um, and the difference between the older women and the younger women was enormous. The younger women's aspirations were, you know, for so much more, you know, their, their world had changed. 
but the difference between the older man and the younger man hadn't changed. They were the same, and I thought that was one of the most worrying things I'd seen, because if you don't have young men changing their aspirations and their views of the world as well, then sooner or later we're going to have a clash. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes back to what Lula was saying earlier on about needing to work with you know, men and boys as well as the women and girls. And um, any other questions? Um, I guess on, on the topic of educating women, and you spoke of how in the Congo rape was seen as a taboo and kind of the social stigma attached to things. Um, with the violence there and the fear of violence, how, um, how many generations would it take of education to kind of break that social stigma and to kind of come to a point where the social stigma, because it seems quite an impediment to the change, more so than, I mean, the violence is, is, is atrocious as well, but it seems like the social stigma of being then excluded from the community um, and the way it affects the generations to come, how long would it take to kind of alleviate these and kind of, I don't know, give social change kind of in this situation? I think it would take generation to come. I'm not sure how long exactly I can predict that, but to change somebody's behave, behavior and thinking, it takes a long time. So I'm not saying we should, uh, I'm saying here that we should uh, take one step at a time. So let's see what's work first. Because women mostly in the Congo are around these children, and uh, there is a say where they say educating one woman is educating the whole community. And that can play into this you know, crisis in the Congo. So if we can invest more money in education, in health, uh, in um, basic needs like economic, uh, giving women power to contribute at the local level, to put their voice they are demanding some of their rights, so protection, the women can monitor that will be a good thing. At the same time, I'm saying is a, is not a black and white uh, solution. We need to get the men involved. We need to show them that uh, if we keep going like this, it's not just impacting on women, it's impacting to the whole nation. There won't be any future generation to lead the country, and the country will be always at war and uh, having problem. But if we really care about our future generation, we have to empower the women. We have to look at them because they constitute the, more, the poorest you know, community in the world. I think it's a, there's a real uh, argument in that question for, for getting women involved in the peace processes as well. Yes. And where we've seen, you know, where this has happened, and I'm thinking sort of Northern Ireland, Solomon Islands, Bougainville, you know, all around the world, where women have come into a peace process, they tend to come together from both sides to think about, you know, how do we get education services to the kids? Yes. How do we get the health services to the kids? And it, it can be a unifying factor across it. Rwanda yes. is another really good example uh, of women, where women have participated in that mm -hmm. process and by doing that have managed to, I think, reduce the time exactly that the communities have, have needed to get over some. Timor-Leste as well, I think, is a good example where women have come together and participated in the process. This is one of the strongest arguments, I think, for getting women involved in exactly. those processes. And most of the peace agreement that's been broken and fell, you see the number of women that participate is quite really mm. a small number. So that's the reason, because they were not there while they're making this decision. Yeah. They didn't take into consideration how we impact on the women and girls and children. Mm -hmm. So usually bringing women, increasing the number of women into peace agreement and stuff like that will really <coughs> cut the time short. Yeah. I think the other thing is, is ensuring that the justice system is um, holistically addressing the issue of, of um, of supporting women and so very different context but um, you know in Thailand UN women's working in the court system not just to support the judges and, and the, the lawyers in those in those uh, cases but 
right through to the security guard who mans the desk at the, at the front of the court, who they were finding was, was sort of interrogating women as they came into the courtroom and asking, well, what happened to you and why did that happen and why are you here, what are you trying to prove? And too often women were actually saying, look, I'm just going to walk away, I don't want to be part of this at all. And so actually looking at the entire justice system from you know, reporting to the police, from talking to your community about what's happened, and actually trying to address and give women pathways that are multifaceted and supportive of their experience, and that also get to a point where they feel like yeah. they've... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think also strengthening this justice system, because the same people, you find a judge who <laughs> committed the same crime, and it's up there, you just say to the woman, okay, go, this is happening to everybody and that's it. Or maybe corruption in places like DRC play a key role. Is either you have money, you have power. If you don't, you, don't, you really have to suffer. And mostly are women who have no income or land. So they have to pay for their life. And they are ashamed to go up there and say, oh, I've been raped, or I need justice because of the stigma attached there. So it's currently, when we're thinking about responding, is to have this holistic approach, an integrated approach, some people say, where you're not just addressing one thing, but you're addressing all other things that is underlying. So did you come across, have you come across um, cases where women have been raped and their, their husbands, their families have stood by and said, we're not going to go? I've, it's very rarely, but there have been uh, cases where justice and peace now are working with families and men to just telling them it's not the fault of your wife, mm. it's not the fault of your girl and uh, women. The only things I say is attached also to economic because girls, once they rape, they consider as damaged good. So the family who never receive dowry. So that's mean, you know, income. Usually it's the trade of animals and stuff like that. So why keep that girl at home? Because she's not going to bring anything. So the parents who really chase the girl away, even though it was not her fault. Mm -hmm. So by now, working with the family and saying, yes, this is a person, she still have a future. She can still go to school and contribute. And when they can see that this girl is able to contribute and everybody get involved and they start giving them some kind mm. of consideration. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I've seen though, in, and in Aceh it's a case in question where widows under the conflict uh, pre-tsunami, uh, widows have become very stigmatized in their communities because nobody knew who'd shot the husband, whether he was a trade, which side he'd been on and things. And nobody spoke to them. They were incredibly stigmatized. Most of them were young with children. And um, um, what's happened is those widows have come together and uh, work, and they formed uh, groups together. Um, and that's become a really powerful way. And, and a lot of those widows are now being elected into their village governments and things like that. Uh, it's really, and I think Rwanda also had a case where, where those stigmatized women were, were brought together and helped to form uh, strong, powerful groups and engage on their own right into decision making and things. I have another question from Timor-Leste, from Paula Meyer, from the Communication Forum for Women of Timor-Leste. And you alluded to this before about women getting into positions of power um, but then being beholden to the, the party politics. But she said, could you please share your experience on coalition building among women, say from different political parties? In Timor-Leste there is increasing disunity due to partisan politics. Hmm. Uh, and it happens. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it, it is a mistake that we that we make, that we think that women will always act together as women. And actually, the reality is, is they don't, you know, we don't expect men to act together. So why would we expect women to get together? And we do have a tendency to simplify um, this and make it. And it, I think, you know, it, it does help when there is a separate agenda. So bringing, you know, have it if, where you have things like national action plans or uh, things where, you, where women have come together from different uh, sides and agreed on a, an agenda and then everyone can come around that and push it. I think without that, you know, it gets, 
very messy, but, but also working with the women outside um, and really sort of finding out what, what they want, what are, you know, if there are specific things that everybody comes together to push through, you know, is it the sexual violence law or, a, you know, inheritance laws or changes to a family law or something, that brings people together to drive changes through. But quite honestly, I think, you know, sometimes we should just let different parties take different approaches mm -hmm. and, and not force a unity. Mm -hmm. Perhaps do that through the civil right. groups. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question, if there are any here. Yep. So my name is Christine Bowers, and I'm with IFC here in Sydney. And um, it's interesting, you guys haven't talked directly about microfinance. It's come up a little bit obliquely. And um, obviously there's a bit of a kind of a backlash or sort of a loss of enthusiasm around microfinance. And I'm just wondering um, what your impressions are if, if you think that microfinance revolution has, you know, shrunk the gap as much as it's going to? Like, have we gotten as much of the gender benefit from microfinance as we can? Or do you think that there's still, um, you know, significant room for improvement on that front? Or should we be looking at other, um, other ways to really open up economic opportunities for women? Mm. Thanks. There's still a lot of places for microfinance to <laughs> permeate, I assume. But um, Julie, did you want to say anything? Okay. Uh, I think like everything, <laughs> microfinance is, is only one strategy to empower women and I think um, one of the challenges is that it isn't seen as an end game, it, that, that it isn't, okay, we can just give this, this woman or this group of women you know, an initial loan and they'll be fine after that, that actually it needs to be supported in a whole range of ways at all levels. Um, I don't know whether either of you would like to comment further on on microfinance? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's entering a new era, actually. <laughs> I hope it is. Um, that, that it moves beyond just this sort of, you know, that there was a bit of a cookie cutter approach there for a while and, you know, form a group and give them some money and save and, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, and that moving on into sort of a broader range of instruments that meets different needs of different people. Um, I was working with um, on female migrant workers in Indonesia and, you know, their, their issue was remittances and only 10% of the remittances sent back to Indonesia went through a formal banking system. Why? Why? Because they weren't catering to women and women were most of the migrant workers. Um, and they didn't have, they weren't giving them the loans up front to pay for the tickets because they were women, you know. When they were in the foreign countries, they were making them come in the back door of the bank. Well, you know, who's going to go to the bank if they have to go in through the back door? So I think, you know, a respect for um, women as economic actors, um, providing the range of instruments, catering to different needs of different people and different groups. Um, so, yeah, I'm full of um, hope for the future of microfinance. Yeah, I think it's one area we should not say be discouraged because maybe the approach that we use, uh, we were lacking. Let's look at the gap. What's really, why it didn't work in some places. Uh, in Rwanda at one stage, I think uh, just after the genocide, people put a lot of money into microfinance. Didn't work in there, but uh, when they change the approach, things just move along very well. You cannot just come to a country like DRC and say, these women never handle all this prob uh, money or $50 before, and you gave her that. The demand on a family, the pressure this woman receive, you mostly creating more harm than what you're supposed to do. I'm not saying don't do that, but uh, look at the gap and the approach. Don't just use microfinance on itself. Let's use an integrated approach. Let's look at those other things that affect a woman before doing this one. So otherwise you're just creating a recipe for disaster. I think it's also part of it is that it's a huge topic and we haven't had a chance to discuss everything that would be um, useful or feed into this discussion. But I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We've run out of time. And also please join me in thanking our um, panelists, Julie McKay, Lulu Mitzshabu and Gillian Brown.
And I hope you can join us in a month's time for the next Praxis. And if you'd like to subscribe to the podcast or look at previous episodes, uh, please go online to the World Bank or worldbank.org forward slash Praxis. Thank you. Goodbye.